ahead and get things started tonight. Let's go ahead and uh, come on in and uh, we'll get things cranked up this evening. Take out your Bibles, if you would, please, and we'll do our memory verse. We'll start there tonight, then we'll pray, get into our missionary letters and uh, get moving in the service here tonight. Isaiah 41, <coughs> Isaiah 41, and verse number 10 is our memory verse. And so let's go over that a couple, two, three times here this evening. Isaiah 41, verse 10. I hope you're there. Let's go ahead. Ready? Begin. For fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, 10. All right, let's say it again. Ready? Begin. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, 10. All right, as best you can, try to say it from memory tonight. Ready? Begin. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Isaiah 41, 10. All right, sounding good. Let's go ahead and pray that God would meet with us this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for an opportunity to be with your people tonight, Lord, to be in your house, Lord, uh, to come around your word, uh, to worship you, to lift up our hearts and voices in song tonight, Lord, to come before the throne of grace and prayer. Father, for all of these things, we're asking you to meet with us and encourage us, Lord, fill them with, with, with meaning, fill them with your spirit, fill them with power. And Lord, Lord, be careful to give you the praise for all that you will do tonight. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, if you would please, uh, well, actually, uh, don't take anything out. Let me just uh, read to you some things that are happening with our missionaries around the world. And so certainly keep all of them in your prayers, if you would please. It's good to hear from the, uh, the Angeles. Of course, we hear from them pretty regularly. I think most people are keeping up with them, uh, with Christy being here so very much. But just... Uh, a quick update to let you let you know what's happening with them. They did have a, a Bible Institute class. They're, they're moving forward with that after Fernando's work that he had done and praising God for 11 to 12 ladies and men that are atten attending the Institute class and an opportunity for them to grow and learn the Bible better and understand their relationship with the Lord much better. Uh, keep that in your prayers, if you would, please. The work is going forward on the radio station. Uh, they're hoping maybe to really have... Uh, uh, some work done by 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 mid year this year, but keep that in your prayers if you would please. Um, also, the she does mention here the the update for Fernando. I think everybody knows that he had his surgery on the twenty third and and treatment on the seventeenth. Uh, but he is going to return in April uh, to for a check out. He did have some spots on his lungs, and they certainly want to follow up with that and uh, pray that that goes well. Uh, that there won't be any complications with that. Uh, he has begun preaching and uh, teaching, and praise God for that. Uh, they do mention one of the new churches that has started up in the, in, in the last couple of years in Tanukum, uh, Tacunum, uh, Tanakunum. Uh, I, I wish I wouldn't butcher these things, but uh, praise God for the work that is going on there. Uh, a young man, a man by the name of Adam and his family have started this, this ministry in their home. Uh, they've been excited about the things that they've been learning through uh, the ministry with Fernando and, and, and Christy and the things that they've been learning. Uh, she says that Adam had such a heart uh, to learn, so Fernando invited him to be a part of the Read and Review Committee with the Old Testament. He's just been learning uh, and growing and excited about uh, planting this church. Uh, way back when Fernando was di first diagnosed with the cancer, uh, he had come to him and said that he'd like to do more for the Lord, and that involved planting a church in his village and so now, uh, a little over a year later, uh, the church is doing well, and they're going out and reaching uh, souls for Christ, and people are being saved. And so praise God for Adam and the work that's going on uh, because of the, of the work of our missionaries there. So keep it all in your prayers, if you would, please. Um, let's see. They also mentioned some of the things that they do uh, soul winning-wise. And then also, uh, they're talking about a Bible study. Oh, Christy uh, mentions one of the, some of the work that they're doing here as well, that her and Blanche are doing with Bible studies. And one of the reasons why they're, they're late here on, on Wednesday is they're doing a, uh, a Bible study at a, at a nursing home on Wednesday night. So pray that that would go well. In particular, they're asking us to pray for a Cecil 
and Nancy uh, that have been coming, but uh, they're not saved. And so pray for their salvation, if you would, please. The Unruhs to Sri Lanka have updated us as well. This is an interesting prayer letter. It's more of a, uh, of a prayer uh, that, that he writes to God. And, and throughout it all, he's saying, thank you, Father, and as though he's praying. Uh, so I'll, but I do want to update you with some of the things that, that uh, he's thanking the Lord for. In particular, at the beginning of the year, they put together uh, some, some bags containing Johns and Romans and uh, some tracts and, and a pen and, as well. And they've been passing those out since the beginning of the year, and he's very thankful for the response that they've had to that. They've been able to pass out a few thousand uh, since the new year. I pray that that would continue to go well as they uh, distribute those and pass them around to folks, that hearts and lives will be changed. He also mentions an opportunity that they've had to be in some new places with some new people and meeting some new people. He mentions in particular, he thanks the Lord for uh, five in particular in one of these villages that they were in, uh, five of a particular f uh, family uh, that, that are all Hindus that have expressed an interest in, be in becoming Christians and knowing Christ. So pray that that would work out as well. He sincerely is praying for that family. Uh, then also at a youth meeting where three Buddhist teen girls uh, came to hear the gospel for the very first time. They're still coming, but uh, don't f fully all understand all of it. But uh, pray about that, as, uh, if you would, that God would begin to work the truth into their hearts uh, he also mentions the, uh, that uh, he had measles apparently uh, recently and praising God for his healing. And then also he mentions a pastor in Pakistan who has helped them by sending a translator all the way from Pakistan to come to their ministry there uh, to help with their Urdu, con uh, Urdu con congregation, uh, the language that they speak there in Pakistan. And so praise God for that. Uh, God is working and ministering through that. And uh and just a, a couple of the things you want to read through these letters yourself and these updates, uh, keep them s sincerely in your prayers. The Aaron family in South Africa have updated us as well. They wanted to get a, a real uh, kickoff into the new year. And uh, so they, uh, they were having folks invite throughout the month of, of January. And uh, throughout that month, they had a total of 34 new visitors coming uh, to Compassion Baptist Fellowship. And so we praise the Lord for those new contacts that they had throughout the month of January. Pray that that would go well. They also uh, culminated all of it, uh, it sounds like, in a friends and family uh, Sunday, and they had 71 in attendance for that, and so uh, that was a record attendance for them, so we're grateful for that. Uh, and so they haven't been there that long, and we're just grateful that God is moving and working uh, in their midst. Uh, they mentioned a ladies' fellowship that they had for the first time uh, in, during Valentine's, and that went well. Uh, encouraging the ladies, and then also he's been trying to uh, reach the youth in their community uh, by playing soccer, and they found a field ac actually across the street from the church that had been abandoned by the, uh, by the municipality, and so he went to the, uh, the, the city council and asked if he could have permission to clear the land and begin to use it again as a soccer field, and of course, you know, the free labor, why not? The, the, the city said, sure. And so he's been clearing that land and looking forward to an opportunity to really reach out to the youth in their area uh, by having an activity. And so pray about that if you would, and we certainly would appreciate that. But keep all of our missionaries in your prayers if you would, please. Certainly would appreciate that. Uh, well, the, some things we have coming up. Uh, we do have uh, um, outreach this Saturday. So we have a, our soul winning time, regular, regular time at, at 10 o'clock on Saturday. Hope everybody will be able to come. Uh, this Sunday, of course, is uh, Resurrection Sunday. Looking forward to a great day that day. But Saturday gives us an opportunity to take uh, some special Easter flyers that we have, inviting folks to our Easter service. And we have about 5,000 of those. And we need some help getting those things out. So if you can help us with that, we sure would appreciate that. Uh, many hands make light work. And it's easy, uh, easiest soul winning you ever do. We're just going to go around and uh, get as many out as we can and uh, on as many doors as we can. So help us out this Saturday, if you would, please. And then, uh, of course, be in prayer for Resurrection Sunday as well, this Sunday. And then we have the Seed Vine Project coming up. Um, and I think everybody knows what that's all about. If you have any questions about that, come and see us. But it's an opportunity for us on a Friday and a Saturday to come together uh, on the first weekend in April and uh, put together some Johns and Romans in a, in a foreign language. We don't know what that language is just yet. Uh, that will go out into the mission field and be a blessing to missionaries uh, as they will get those, uh, those, those packets free and be able to pa pass out the Word of God 
in their areas. And so pray about that, if you would, please. Hope that everybody will be involved in that. Uh, again, it's another situation where many hands make light work. We'll just set up this whole auditorium that we, like we've done in the past and, and just have different stations where you can be working, doing different things, folding, uh, um, binding, um, cutting, uh, all, all those stapling, all those things that need to be done. And come and help us with that, if you would, please, the Seed Vine Project. And then lastly, real quickly, uh, next month, um, uh, there is a new church that's uh, starting up, uh, a church plant in Lavernia, and we're excited about that. Uh, it's uh, Matt Green is the pastor at New Life Baptist Church in Converse. His, his brother is starting that church, and we're excited about that, want to help out with that. They're going to have an opportunity to, for us to go and, and uh, knock some doors and encourage folks to come to the grand opening of that. So on uh, April the 13th next month, mark your calendar for that. We'd like to go out to Lavernia and just be there that day and encourage folks to, uh, to come and be a part of a brand new church plant, an exciting thing that's happening there in Lavernia. So help us with that, if you would, please. We sure would appreciate that. And so on that particular uh, outreach sa uh, Saturday, we won't be meeting here. We'll be meeting there. So uh, just be aware of that and, and keep that in mind. But now it's time for us to sing tonight. So let's go ahead and take out our songbooks and stand together and open our songbooks to... 629 as we stand together tonight let's sing out for uh, for the glory of our savior 629 as we enter the easter season what a great time to be reminded of just how much he loves us 629 as we sing both verses We'll sing all three verses as well. remain standing for scripture reading this evening. Thank you, Chris. All right, let's take out our Bibles tonight and open to the book of Revelation. If you're happy to be in God's house, say amen. 
Amen. Revelation chapter number 15 tonight. And uh, we're going to read just a couple of verses here and pray and get into our time together tonight around God's Word. Look with me, if you would, please, at Revelation 15 and verse number 3. The Bible says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Let's pray here tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we fall before you this evening, Lord, and come before the throne of grace, we're asking you, Father, to minister to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us just to come around the throne and open up our hearts and minds and allow you to instruct us and teach us tonight. Help us, Lord, to see not only what is happening here in Revelation, what is happening with these martyrs, but uh, the way in which you can impact our lives and make a difference for time and for eternity. Lord, help me tonight to be yielded to you, an instrument, Father, that you can use for your honor and for your glory. And Lord, I pray the very same for each and every person that is here tonight, that we would all be willing to be a vessel, Father, in your hand to be used to make a difference for time and for eternity. Mold us and shape us into the image of your dear Son, and Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we re return to our study here tonight in the book of Revelation, we are still considering the saints who had gotten the victory over the beast. We didn't read verse number 2, but read there with me real quickly. The Bible says, and I... And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory, so it is these that we are talking about, those that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, and they stand on the sea of glass having harps of God, and there they are in verse number three, they are singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And so we're talking about uh, these saints who had gotten the victory over the beast, as it says in verse number two. Now, these saints are the martyrs that we learned about when Jesus opened the fifth seal way back in chapter number six. And here in chapter 15, they are standing on a sea of glass, as the Bible says. They are purged by the blood of the lamb and purified by the refining fires of God. And the text presents them as victors over the beast and over his image and over his mark. And as vi victors, they are not only standing on a sea of glass before the temple of God, they are also singing, as we have seen here in verses number 3 and 4, again singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, and thy judgments uh, are made manifest. And so they're singing the, this song, the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Moses had won the victory over Egypt, you recall, back in the book of Exodus. And Egypt is a type of the world. And the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, wins the victory over the world there on the cross Therefore, their song is a song of victory, like the song of Moses is a song of victory. The song of the Lamb is a song of victory, and theirs is as well. Uh, the, uh, Moses knew victory, uh, the Lord knows victory, and these martyred saints have certainly experienced victory over the world as well, over the beast and over his image and over his mark. And so victory is a good reason to sing, but it's not only a song of victory, it is also a song of joy. When we win, well, that's a joyful time. We're excited about winning, and so we want to celebrate when we win. And celebrations often take the form 
of song or singing. And that's what we see here. That these victors are singing out to God. But their joy is not limited to the fact that they are victors. Their song is also an expression of the joy that they are now in the eternal presence of God Almighty God. The Bible says, and in his presence is fullness of joy and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so now they're filled with joy because they are in the presence of their Savior that they have longed for for so very long. And we cannot begin to imagine now uh, the idea of what they have gone through, but now their hearts are filled, uh, filled with joy. And so their song is a song of victory. It is a song of joy, and it is also a song of adoration. These tribulation martyrs have endured a a, a fate that none of us want to would ever want to go through. Jesus describes the tribulation that they went through as great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world uh, to this time. No, nor shall ever be, Jesus says. The world has never known the kind of tribulation that these saints are going to go through. And the world never will know that same kind of tribulation, the greatness of the things that they that they suffer, that they suffer and go through. So we cannot begin to imagine the torments of body and of soul that they will endure. And yet through it all, they will cling to their faith. They will cling to their Savior because of their adoration for the Lord. And the great tribulations of this world cannot move them because of the way that they adore their Lord and Savior. It doesn't move them. They can say with Paul, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so Paul, as a victor, is crying out and saying, listen, all the things that we go through are not worthy to be compared to the glory that we will have when we stand in the presence of God, Almighty God. And these martyrs are a testimony to that truth. They too had endured all the things of this life, even the worst that this world can throw at you. And they have stood fast in their faith. And now they too can say that that those things that they went through do not begin to compare to the glory that they receive standing in front of God. So now they're there on that crystal sea. Their faith has brought them through, has carried them through the darkest days ever. And and now their faith has become sight. And the glory which is now revealed in them is indeed far greater than the sufferings that they, they endured during this life. And so they do the thing that makes the most sense at that time. Again, once they've been through that kind of tribulation and they came out the other side, Victor, what would you do? Likely you too would sing. It's the thing that makes the most sense. And so they begin to sing in adoration to God Almighty God. And would to God tonight that as we see this example of these martyrs, would to God that we too would sing more in our own lives. I'm not talking about the songs of this world. I mean, when you stand before God Almighty God, you're not going to sing, you ain't nothing but a hound dog. That's not going to even come to your heart and mind. You with me? But to sing the true songs of faith. The Lord wants to hear us sing songs of adoration right now in our life. Did you ever think about that? Listen, when you're going about your daily business and the things that that God brings into your life and the obstacles that you have to overcome, God wants to hear you sing. God wants to hear you sing songs of adoration and praise unto him, even at that time, not songs that cater to the flesh, but songs that really minister to the spirit. The Bible says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, singing to the Lord, not to the flesh, Not to the world, not for the world, not for the flesh, but unto God, Almighty God, we're to sing unto him. So with that in mind, I'd like for us to take a look at this song that is sung, because I do believe that we as Christians ought to sing more in adoration to the Lord, even in our lives today. So let's take a look at this song. And we begin with the fact that during the song, these martyrs sing out and say about the Lamb that he is Almighty. So number one is the... uh, The Lamb is Lord God Almighty. He is Lord God Almighty. 
Look at verse number three, if you would, please. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. And so the Lamb is Lord God Almighty. The word nevertheless is one word, but it is a compound of three words. Nevertheless, right? And almighty is similar to that. Only in this case, it's not three words, but it's a compound of two words, all and mighty. And the idea is that the almighty or the almighty has all might. That's the idea that is contained in that, in that word almighty, that, that he is the almighty God because he has all might. It has been given unto him. In, in other words, the idea of Almighty, there's, not, there's no power, if you will, no might in this world that God does not possess. The word omnipotent is not found in your Bible. But the word omnipotent means all power, having all power. The Bible word for that is Almighty. And so the idea that God has all power, He's omnipotent, it all belongs to Him. And by the way, this song that they're singing, declaring that the Lamb is the Lord God Almighty, is an indication that, well, God is, Jesus is Almighty God. But not only that, Jesus said it Himself in Matthew 28. Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now you need to think about that claim. All power. How much power is that? That's all of it. It's like all might. All power is given unto me. Jesus is claiming to be God because only God can hold all power, can have all power. In other words, here's what it means. The word omnipotent defines who? God, right? Or Jesus, right? It, defines, it doesn't define a, cre a creature because a creature cannot be all powerful. We can't be, amen? Only God can be. That is a descriptor of God that God does not share with his creation. So if Jesus is saying, all power is given unto me, that means that he has the ability to, well, have all power. Therefore, he is the omnipotent God. Amen? And so he is claiming to be, uh, to be God Almighty God by saying, all power is given unto me. Jesus can possess all power because he is God. And like it says here in, the, in Revelation, he is Lord God Almighty. Now his might, the idea of having might is associated with his works. And so his works, as the verse says here, as the song says, his works are great and marvelous. Look at it again. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are thy works. Whose works? Lord God Almighty. This is the song of the Lamb, who is Lord God Almighty, and his works are great and marvelous. Now, I want you to think with me about these works that are great and marvelous. Number one, they are great. So let's talk about his great works. Great is a small word. It's not a very big word. And it really kind of seems too small of a word to describe the work of Almighty God and the things that God can do. And so the word of God elaborates for us on the greatness of our God and his work saying this, for by him all things were all things created. So Jesus Christ in the book of Colossians there, the Bible says that Jesus is the almighty God. By him all things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. By the way, I think the idea in that verse is to make clear that when God says all things, he's really talking about all things. All things that are in heaven and all things that are in earth, whether they be visible or invisible. All of the heavens, all of the stars, all of the galaxies, all of the vast expanses of space, all of that God created. He is the creator of all of these things the, 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 he, he made them for himself. Now, when we think about power, we might think of, of, of power from our own kind of vantage point. For instance, look, I don't know about you, but if you've ever been in the proximity, of, the proximity of, a, of a lightning bolt coming down, that's power, amen? It's scary power. 
if you've ever been close to it. And boy, that, that's just a, 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 a display of power. An earthquake. You ever been in an earthquake? That is a display of real power, having the actual ground shaking and moving in ways you didn't know it could. Amen? It's not supposed to do that kind of thing. But that's real power. You might think of a tornado. Some people like to chase after tornadoes. Good luck with that. Amen. But anyway, <laughs> some folks like to chase those things down. But one of the reasons they do is because they're mesmerized by the power, the sheer power of a tornado. Just a, it's just a spinning cloud, but man, it is, it, it is full of power. Or, or take the tornado and, and expand it a hundred times, and now you've got a hurricane, or a thousand times, and you've got a hurricane, and that's real power as well. Or, or we could think about the energy that burns in the depths, of, in the core of the sun, and, 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 and the heat that is emitted by that. And all of these things speak of us, uh, speak to us, speak to us, uh, speak to us <laughs> of great power. Someone help me out. Amen. They speak to us of great power. These things that we see in this world. And for us, all of these things are examples of just that. But consider now, having thought about these kinds of things like a tornado or a hurricane or a lightning bolt or any of the or the sun for that matter. Consider all the energy of the whole universe. Consider all the energy of all the st- uh, of the stars. We have one star, we have the sun, and we, th- and we think about the great power that it emits, the great power that it has. Take all of the stars of our galaxy and of all galaxies and combine them all together. If you can bring all that power into one place, all of that great energy is the kind of energy that man has never begun to measure, and yet Jesus holds all of that together in his hand. That's astounding. The kind of power that he has. The Bible says, by him, all things consist. You know what that means? That means all things. It comes on the heel of the verse before where it tells us what all things are. All things that are in heaven. All things that are in earth. Whether they be visible or invisible. Principalities and powers, all of it, it all consists because of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if he were to let it go, it'd all fly apart. He holds it all together with his power. This power that we, that, that we think is so great and we see is so marvelous is really meaningless if God isn't holding it all together. Now that is great work. And so great and marvelous are thy works but not only are they great, they're marvelous. Talk to, let's talk about the idea of marvelous. When I was in, when I was in grade school, I had, this, I had this, this great, fantastic, brand new technology. It was a football game that you could hold in your hand. And the football players were LED dashes. Just a red dash. You've seen it, right? And you just do it going like this, getting the guy going... It could only go, you know, three, uh, you know, two up or two down, like three spots that it could run in, right? It was pretty useless these days, but it was fantastic back then, you know? That was great technology. Just LED dashes. Now, today, I have a mobile phone, a telephone with graphics that are better than the TVs were back then. And I can hold it in my hand. It, a matter of fact, the telephone I have that is much more powerful, than, that has even better graphics than the TVs back then that were ginormous. Remember the old cathode ray tubes? You had to you know, set this deep, right? And, and that that I hold in my hand is, is greater than that. And by the way, it's smaller than that big old game that I had in my hand that I thought was fantastic and could do those limited things. It's amazing when you think about it, the technology to stop and think about the works of man in just my lifetime, is to marvel how far we've come. You with me? Just in my lifetime. But man's work will never outmarvel God's. You see, man has yet to produce a technology that can marvel, that, that can compare and marvel to the human brain that can compare in marvel to the machinery of the human body. 
man's technology must bow before the marvelous wonders of God's work and the things that he does. Yet greater still is the marvel of Christ's work on Calvary. Here's something that has always interested me. The Bible says that the angels are created a little higher than us, or we are a little lower than them, as the Bible says. For thou hast made him, has made man, a little lower than the angels. No doubt the angels of heaven look upon the great achievements of man, the, the things that I was just talking about, and, and no doubt they look down on us because, uh, again, we're a little lower than them. And, and I'm sure maybe if they, could, if they could speak to us, they might say something like this, well, it's about time you started using that brain of yours that God gave you. You know, unimpressed really by our technology and the things that we do because we are lower even than the angels. But did you know That when it comes to the work of redemption, the work that God did, not what man does, but what God does in saving us and creating his church, the Bible says that the angels not only look on with wonder, but the Bible says that they see in what God is doing in the life of saved men and women and creating his church, that they see the very wisdom of God. Did you know that? Turn to Ephesians chapter 3 real quick. All right, God has work that he's doing, and, and we don't have time to read this whole passage. We're just going to limit ourselves to just two quick verses here, beginning in verse number 9 of uh, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, 9, the Bible says, To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, and the fellowship of the mystery is the church that God is creating, from which, uh, which from the beginning of the world have, have been hid in God. So the Old Testament saints didn't know about this mystery, this fellowship that is coming, the church itself who created all things by Christ Jesus. And so God, uh, the Father, uh, created everything by the Lord Jesus Christ to the intent, now listen to this, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Who are the principalities and powers in heavenly places? Those are the angels, both fallen and, and, and unfallen. So the principalities and powers in heavenly places to the intent that these angels, to, to them might be known By the church, the manifold wisdom of God. That's staggering. Did you know, Lighthouse Baptist Church, that you are a marvelous work of God, Almighty God, and that the angels themselves look over the ramparts of heaven, so to speak, And they see Lighthouse Baptist Church and what God is doing in the hearts and the lives of men and women in his church and they marvel and they see in us the very wisdom of God. That's staggering to me. And I don't understand all the reasons, but but they see the wisdom of God. And in a sense, you can understand it because you didn't do it. Did you save yourself? No. Did you build the church? No. God is building his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. It's not our church, it's his church. And this is God working in the world. And the angels are staggered by it. And in it, they see the wisdom of God. And so his his works are great and marvelous, so much so that the angels that are above us, that we are created a little lower than, they marvel at the work that God is doing in the world. And so the song of the martyred saints of God, as we turn back to the book of Revelation now, this song is a song about Jesus being Lord God Almighty and that his works are great and marvelous. But it is also a song about the king of saints. And so let's look at that secondly here this evening. So look again at verse number three here in chapter 15. The Bible says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou king of saints. He is the Lord God Almighty. He is also the king of saints. Jesus 
is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, the Bible says. And when he returns to earth in all of his glory, the Bible says that he will have on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, when he returns in, in, in Revelation 19. Now this name, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, it is related to the idea of, of, of Christ's government and of his sovereignty in the world at that time. And so that, and so that all of his ways are just and true. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the sovereign of all, and all of his ways are just and true, as the Song of the Saints confirmed for us. Look again at the end of verse number three. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So in his government... He shall be just and he shall be true. Let's take a look at those two ideas here real quickly. Let's consider the fact that his ways are just. Men's ways are not. His ways are just, but man's ways are not just. The word just meaning right. In other words, man's ways are not always right. So because mankind doesn't always do that which is right, we need some guardrails in place. And so as a society, as a governmental entity, if you will, we establish uh, rules through our government. We establish governments, for that matter, to restrain the injustices of man. Man is unjust. He's not just. And because of his injustices, we need laws, so to speak, on the book. And those that will judge over mankind with governmental authority to restrain the injustices of man. Nevertheless... Have you ever heard of a ruling from the judges of man and thought, well, that's not right? That ever happened? Something come out of our courtrooms and you say, well, that's not just. Why? Because the same kind of people that are unjust and wind up in our justice system are running our justice system because we're all, well, we're all a mess. Amen. Man is not just. Our systems are, of justice are run by unrighteous men. Now, we have a system of justice that is intended to restrain injustice while run by men who themselves are unjust. And yet we have no choice but to have that kind of system in place if you don't want anarchy. Amen? But God's ways are not like the ways of men. He has never done anything wrong, and He never will. He is perfectly just. Therefore, he is perfectly fit to be our king, to be the true king of kings and Lord of lords, to be the king of the saints. Because he is just. He's also true. Let's talk about this idea of true, that Jesus is true. United Airlines, when I worked for them in, in management, they used to send a, the, the managers to management training uh, seminars. I guess we needed it, I suppose. And they would often break us up into teams right when we got there. And you'd sit at a, a table with your team and then another team over there. And they'd put us in teams, hopefully uh, with teams of people that we didn't know. So they would, would assign us to these teams. And more than once, we were asked to develop in our teams a list of leadership qualities by order of priority. What are the qualities of good leadership? And we'd sit around our little teams and we'd We'd hash that thing out and we'd come up with our list and the table over there would come up with their list and the table over there would come up with their list. And lo and behold, almost always at the top of these lists was the idea of integrity. Integrity. Leadership needs to have integrity. We want leaders, in other words, who are true to their word, who say what they mean and mean what they say. Now, why do you suppose that integrity was always near the top? Because it is the quality that is sorely lacking in our world. And because it's sorely lacking in our world, it's sorely lacking in, in, in businesses and in, in management as well. Those who are running the show are lacking in this idea of integrity. And so we would come to these meetings and we would identify the problem that, that we need integrity but a year later or two years later, we'd go back to these kinds of trainings again, and guess what would come up all over again? Integrity. It didn't get fixed from one meeting to the next, so to speak. You see, we all fall short. Now, 
Again, all of us could say that integrity is, is, a, is a high bar, that we, we want our leaders to have integrity. But by the way, we do as well. We want to, be, we, we want to have integrity in our own lives. And the fact of the matter is we all fall to, fail to meet that standard. I wish that it weren't so, but we all fail to meet. We all fall short. We are all inconsistent in our life. We want consistency, but we're not always consistent. We're not always true to our word. We miss the mark. Now, I, for one, am not nearly so consistent as I would love to be, especially with my children. But I understand that, and I want to get better, and I want to do better. But none of us hits the mark every single time. But the Lord has never been inconsistent. The Lord has always been true. The Lord is the the model of integrity. The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift um, is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, in, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God does not change. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He is worthy to lead us because he is a leader having integrity. He is ever true. He is just and he is true. Lastly, I want you to see in this song that the martyrs announce that Jesus is also holy. The Lord is holy. So look at it again, if you would, please, with me in verse number three. They sing this song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. He is the mighty God, and his works as the mighty God are great and marvelous. He is just and true. Just and true are thy ways. Uh, because thou art the king of saints is, and, and he is worthy to be the king because he is just and true. But then in verse number four, it says, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. The Lord is holy. Listen, if you only had one word to define God, you couldn't pick a better word than holy. I'm not saying that You should limit yourself to just that word. But if you only had one word to define God, holy is a great one word definition of the character of God. You see, everything that is true about the Lord is true because he is holy. It wouldn't be true if he weren't. These things, everything that's true about God is true because he's holy. Holy means complete in perfection, untainted by any imperfection. Because God is holy, therefore he is holy perfect. He's righteous. He is true. He is just. He is blessed. He is divine. He is pure. He is complete. He is undefiled because he is holy. There is no stain or imperfection in any part of God and his being. The word holy comes to us from the old English word halig, and that word means complete And that's a good way to see God, that God is complete in everything. God is love and his love is complete. It doesn't lack anything. It is the ultimate of what love of what love is. God is pure because he is holy in that purity. In other words, he's complete. There's nothing lacking in his whole in his purity. Nothing, nothing that no taint or stain to his purity. God is light. It is holy light. And you can go on and on. The idea, again, that because God is God, he is completely or holy God. Again, the idea, that, that word holy or, or halig, if you will, meaning complete, it's similar to the word whole with a, with a, a, a W-H-O-L-E. You know, the, the, like, like, for instance, if I say I ate the whole pie, I ate the complete thing, all of it. That's kind of the idea, analogous idea, if you will, that God is complete in everything that he is and everything that he does. Because God is God, he is completely God. He is holy God, H-W-O-L-L-Y. Because God is love, he is entirely love. He is holy in his love. He is complete in his love. Because God is powerful, he is completely powerful. He is the all-powerful God like we saw a little while ago. He is the almighty Lord. Why? Because he is complete in his power. There's no hole in his power. There's no, there's no missing link in his power. 
because God is just, he is complete in his justice. Because God is knowledge, there's no holes in his knowledge. God knows everything. The Bible says in, 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 uh, in the book of the Psalms that his understanding is infinite. How can that be? Because there's nothing missing in his knowledge. He is complete and holy in his knowledge because God is present. That means he's complete in his presentness. That means there's no place where God is not. Amen? There's no place to hide from God. God is merciful. That means that he is complete in his mercy. He is holy in his mercy. You could, again, you could go on and on. Talk about your salvation. You know the reason why your salvation is complete in him? The reason why you can't add to it, because your salvation is a work that he did and he is holy. Amen? And it is complete. The Bible says that you are complete in him. You are complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because again, it is God's work and God is holy. Therefore, when God makes his judgments known, as the martyrs declare in our text, that he does then we know that they are complete and entire. They are holy and pure. So look again at verse number four. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. To be made manifest is to be made known. And when his judgments are made known, we know that they are complete and entire. Because again, God is holy. Because he is holy, he is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our worship. He is worthy of our adoration, going back to the fact that the martyrs are here singing. And so the martyrs prophesied in their song that the nations will bow down and worship God because they will recognize that he is holy. So look one more time at verse number four. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy for all nations. They haven't done this yet. But they're prophesying in their song that all nations shall. There's coming a time. It's going to happen. They shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And so the nations of the world are going to bow down and worship God God Almighty God. They're going to recognize that God indeed is worthy. And soon after the martyrs sing their song, this prophecy will be fulfilled in the millennial kingdom. And so remember that we're right near the end of the tribulation period. Now we see before the the vials of judgment are poured out and before the battle of Armageddon and before Jesus comes back in Revelation 19, here they are singing about what's going to happen in Revelation chapter 20. When all the nations are going to bow down to the Lord. Or actually, I should say Revelation 19, when the battle of Armageddon is fought, they will all come and recognize God. So as we wrap up our study tonight, I want you to consider this song again. We're going to read it here in just a moment. We're going to read it again. But I want you to consider it as we do. And as we read it through, I want you to ask yourself a question. Do I sing songs like this one? Again, let me remind you, you're not going to sing. You ain't nothing but a hound dog when you stand before God. But what are you singing now? Do you, are your songs like this one? Likely our hearts are lost in other concerns, unfortunately. Things of this world, the weights of this world, and the trials of this life drown out our song and our singing unto God. And so before we read it again, just let me remind you that these souls that are standing before God and singing are the ones who pass through the greatest trials that this world will ever know. The trials of this life cannot distract you like the trials of of life would, would have distracted them. And they represent themselves before God in song. They present themselves before God in song. So there's not... And as they come before God in song, though they have gone through again the greatest trials that this world will ever know, there's not a note of complaint in their song, in their singing. So look at it again. Let's read it one more time. And again, asking ourselves this question, do I sing songs like this one? And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Do I sing songs like this one? 
By the way, if you sing in our choir, you ought to be able to sing songs like this one. We just sang one for the cantata. It comes right from this text. But regardless of whether or not you're in the choir, the question is, do your songs reflect that kind of heart attitude? When you present yourself before God, is there a complaint in your heart or is there a song in your heart? Do you complain or is there praise? Paul said this, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. If that is true, and if you believe that, then you can have a song if you truly believe that. You can have a song in your heart if you believe that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to where you are going and what God is going to bless you with in the eons to come, in eternity. If you believe that, then let your song be a song of adoration, unmarred by notes of complaint. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for an opportunity, Lord, to be in your house tonight, to open your word and to study it. And Lord, here are two verses in Scripture that really ought to speak to our hearts and cause us, Lord, to ask ourselves some questions. Here are martyrs, men and women, that have been through the worst that the world can throw at them, the worst that Satan and the fallen angels can throw at them, the great tribulation as Jesus defined it. And yet there's no complaint in their heart, just words of adoration. And Lord, I pray, Father, for myself and for my family, and for this church family, and for everyone that is here tonight, Lord, I pray that we would recognize that far too often we are allowing the things of this life to drown out our song of praise. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to sing once again, great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, and punctuate that with a heart that has no regrets, no, no complaints, Lord. And we'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Why don't you take a few moments and just...